topic that I'm going to try to address today is something about how this new era of genomic medicine, which has taken hold in all areas of biomedical science, but also in psychiatry, how this new era of genomic medicine is not only changing what we think psychiatric illnesses are, but how we search for new therapies. So it doesn't, you don't need to be a geneticist or a neuroscientist or a psychiatrist to know that all areas of medicine now are being changed profoundly by the ability to understand the genetic origins of common medical disorders. And this is also true in psychiatry. And let me just remind you why genes in mental illness are so important. Genes, all we've known for really more than 50 years that most of the risk for psychiatric illness uh, runs in families, and it runs in families because of genetics, not because of the culture of families. We know that genes transcend phenomenological diagnosis. This is a major development in psychiatric thinking because as rich and as deep as the history of psychiatry has been as a descriptive uh, discipline, and it has been principally a descriptive discipline. We describe differences between ill people and well people. These differences are the rich phenomenology of illness, but they're nothing having to do with the causations of illness. Genes, by definition, are mechanisms of illness. They transcend phenomenology. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're the only mechanisms of illness. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily the most important mechanisms of illness. But they're the only absolutely objective clues that we have to mechanisms of illness. Genes clarify the environment. Everybody handles uh, 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 experiences the same environment differently because our biological toolbox that we use to, hand, to negotiate the environment is our genetics. And this differs profoundly from one person to another. Genes are the only absolutely objective strategies for defining an individual person's risk. We, as part of the psychiatric history, ask many questions about the histories of our patients. And we ask these questions because we have these beliefs that we can infer something about their future from their past. There is some truth to this but most of it is subjective. Genes, by definition, are objective uh, characteristics of the risk state. And then finally, genes have to lead to new treatments. It's not that we're going to change anyone's genes, but genes are the blueprints by which we develop, our brains develop, and every cell in our body operates. And as a blueprint for the biology of cells, Genes represent clues to how we can reverse biological abnormalities in cells. So there's no question that they will identify new treatments. And I like to say that every single treatment in psychiatry, without exception, there is no treatment that we use in psychiatry that was developed based on any understanding of the causes or pathogenesis of psychiatric illness. Now that we have some clues to these causes, we have to do better than we did when it was all done by accident. So let me just start off by saying at the turn of the 21st century, we began to study individual genes. Psychiatric genetics changed from a study of families or populations or pedigrees, which was virtual genetics based on statistical characteristics of risk within families, to biological genetics, where we were able to study individual genes. And as individual genes were studied, there was evidence that some of the sequence variations in some of these genes were enriched in populations with our psychiatric diagnoses. And in the first decade of the 20th century, this was the kinds of lists that were appearing in the literature. There were genes that were found that were said to show association with a psychiatric diagnosis, meaning that there was some variant in the sequence of those genes that showed greater likelihood to be found in a person with a psychiatric diagnosis than to be found in a control or well person. And so these genes were given different names. It was interesting when most of these genes started to appear, most of us had never heard of any of these genes. We had no idea what they were. And there was an important lesson in that because the lesson was that the human genome 
did not uh, evolve to confirm our favorite hypotheses of what the diseases are. The genes tell us what the diseases are at a very basic cellular and biological level, whether it fits our favorite hypotheses or not. The second thing was none of these genes were about one psychiatric diagnosis or another. They were all found with association to many psychiatric illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, autism, uh, intellectual disability, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which also was a lesson. And the lesson was that the human genome did not evolve to validate the dsm 4 criteria of psychiatric illness. These genes tell us what the illness was. Now, this early phase of genetic discovery became very controversial. And the reason it became very controversial is that people who were um, doubters, who did not believe the early evidence, pointed out that there were too many inconsistencies. And as one looked at this body of literature, you either saw the wine as half full, the glass as half full, or the glass as half empty. And the people that saw it as half full, I don't know if there's a pointer. Oh, is there a pointer? The two, no. People who saw it, it doesn't matter. People who saw it as half empty just saw the inconsistencies. The people who saw it as half full saw, thank you. The people who saw it as half full thought that inconsistencies would not be surprising if you consider that psychiatric illnesses are not really disease entities, they are syndromes. And these syndromes are likely to be biologically uh, uh, and genetically quite heterogeneous from one population to another. Anyway, this led to an approach that now is the predominant gene discovery approach in medicine, which, which assumes no prior uh, expectation of any gene in the genome being more or less likely to be linked to a psychiatric illness and exploits the technology for looking in one assay relatively inexpensively, now at the cost of maybe three or four hundred dollars per individual, uh, or maybe 300 euros per individual, at all the common sequence variants in the genome uh, of, of human beings, which is several million common single nucleotide sequence variants. And it looks across the whole genome for where there are differences between populations. And if you find a difference in the frequency of one variant or another, this is said to be evidence of a genetic association. And that suggests the gene is relevant to the illness. The problem, of course, is if you measure in one, at one uh, assay, six million sequence variants, and you make no assumption that any one of the six million is more likely to be associated with your illness than any other of the six million, you have to control for the fact that there will be many false discoveries. So you have to apply a very, very rigid statistical threshold. You have to control for a million tests. So you need a th statistical threshold of something like 10 to the minus 7 or 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 9. In order to find something with that kind of statistical rigor, you need a very, very large sample. So the first study that did this, which was from the group at Cardiff, found one SNP, one single nucleotide polymorphism, which has this in sig uh, designation, in one gene which no one ever heard of, and we still know very, very little about it, called ZNF804A, and this was the p-value. So it just about was significant correcting for all these tests. So this was a, a, an argument that if you had enough people, you could find evidence of a gene linked to risk for schizophrenia that was basically beyond statistical challenge was likely to be real. This is likely to be a gene that will still be around in five years. The only problem with this was, if you look at the odds ratio here, which is the degree to which inheriting the form of the gene associated with schizophrenia increases your risk as an individual person, the increase in risk is very, very small. So if the, if, the if the chances that anybody in this audience has schizophrenia is 1%, if you inherit this risk form of this variant, your chances are 1.1%. 1 
which is a tiny, tiny increase in risk. Well, the next move was to increase the sample size because this was only with 20,000 people only found one so-called locus. So then the next uh, study, which was published uh, in Nature Genetics about two years ago, was now 51,000 subjects. It's a big sample. And in the 51,000 subjects, now there were five new genes found. Again, nobody ever heard of them. We didn't know anything about these genes. These genes are all critically involved in very early stages of brain development. And again, if you look at these odds ratios, despite the statistics, which now are quite good, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 8, but the odds ratios are still barely increasing anybody's odds, more than 0.1%. So even though these are risk factors, by themselves, they explain very little. So what's the solution to this? Well, clearly, we have to genotype the whole planet to find all the genes that contribute any risk across the population. But this is now the latest version of the international effort, the so-called Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, to find regions in the human genome where there are sequence variants associated with schizophrenia. And this hasn't been published yet, but this is now 70,000 subjects. This is a huge population study from many different countries all over the world, and now, with this much power, there are over 70 regions of the human genome that in these diverse populations contributes risk to schizophrenia. And these are the p-values, meaning the statistical significance. These are the chromosomes. In, in fact, in every single chromosome, with the exception of chromosome 9, there are a loci probably representing variants in genes associated in a, to a statistically significant but very small individual effect on risk for schizophrenia. The lesson here is there are many, many genetic factors across diverse populations that contribute to, these, to the uh, liability for these disorders. There is no one secret pathway to psychiatric illness. There are many, many ways that the early programs of putting a human being together can be noisy, and the result is, is one of our psychiatric syndromes. So let me um, just tell you a little bit more about where this is going, because this is at a very low level of resolution these genome-wide association studies. The next strategy is to dig into the genome and dig into the transcriptome, which is the expression of genes, in individuals. And this is sort of this, this, this massive resequencing effort now of human beings using these machines, which have the capacity to uh, produce an extraordinary amount of biological information in a very rapid time. And there's now um, an increasing effort to characterize human variation at the individual d uh, DNA nucleotide level across human populations. There is huge human diversity. It's very clear that in, that in addition to these common variations in the sequence that, are, that explain a small amount of risk across diverse populations. There are also rare mutations that appear in every individual. Every one of us, every one of us, when we, were, when we became an embryo, has within us something around 30 or 40 mutations that were not in either of our parents that affect the function of genes and proteins. This is just the randomness of DNA replication. There are errors that take place in the formation of gametes. And those errors, not infrequently, affect the biology of proteins. Every one of us has somewhere between 30 and 50 significant protein coding mutations. We obviously manage to buffer these uh, so-called de novo mutations, de novo because they're not in our parents. This is part of the human diversity that builds in resilience, but also builds in susceptibility. 
This has been looked at in schizophrenia. There's very little evidence that rare mutations by themselves account for much of the risk of schizophrenia. But in addition to rare mutations, this is just showing the, the frequency of these very serious functional variants, there's another basis for human variation in the genome, which actually accounts for most of the variation in the genome in terms of the amount of DNA involved. And this is the production of structural variations, which are called copy number variations, or CNVs. During DNA replication, there are regions of the genome where the machinery for replication slips. And it slips as it's reading across the DNA strand and making a new copy of it. And this slippage needs, leads to blocks of DNA that are either deleted or duplicated. And these deletions or duplications are called copy number variations. And there have been a number of studies now digging into the genome with these technologies, showing that copy number variations are part of the genetic architecture of all psychiatric illness. Uh, the first copy number variation that we were familiar with in psychiatry was the deletion of about three million bases of DNA on the 22nd chromosome involving all of these genes. This is the syndrome called velocardiofacial or 22Q11 syndrome. About 0.5% of the patients in your clinics with the diagnosis of schizophrenia, one out of 200, have one of these deletions. And it's probably the cause of this psychiatric illness. About 1% of people, one out of 100, with the diagnosis of autism have one of these deletions. Uh, about a certain percentage of people with intellectual disability have one of these deletions. These masquerade as autism, schizophrenia, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder as children. They're rare events, but they're not that rare. In addition to this copy number variation, we now know that as you look across the genome, there are a number of other regions, and the most prominent ones, in addition to the 22Q11 uh, uh, deletion, this is an image from a large psychiatric uh, genome study, and every one of these red bars represent an individual in the study who had a deletion of this part of the DNA with all these genes involved. There's also been one on the 15th chromosome. There's also been one on the first chromosome. And the one that has probably been found, the only one that involves only one gene, is on the second chromosome. And this is the gene that deletes the first two exons of norexin. And this is actually the work of Giovanna Tortorello, when she was in our group in Washington. She's from the Professor Bertolino's program in University of Bari. And this was looking in families at norexin deletions. Norexin is a protein that is critical for the establishment of synapses. Norexin is a structural protein that holds the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron together in a synapse. And about 1% of patients with the diagnosis of schizophrenia, 0.5 to 1%, have a deletion of these exons right here, the first part of the norexin gene. And these were actually the, the patients that Dr. Totorello studied. It's interesting that some of these were found in healthy parents and were inherited by the ill children. These deletions are not found only in patients with schizophrenia. They're found in autism. They're found in epilepsy. They're found in intellectual disability. They're found in a number of neurodevelopmental disorders because they're very critical for setting up the basic wiring that wires a brain. Um, so let me move on to the bigger question. These are examples of rare factors that contribute to the heterogeneous nature of psychiatric illnesses that are neurodevelopmental factors involved in, in wiring a brain and leading to increased risk. But most people don't have these rare uh, changes in their genome. Most people have common variations in the genome that somehow conspire to increase their likelihood of having illness. So let me start off with two questions. Why have genes for behavior disorders been so controversial? And the second question is, why are these clinical associations so weak 
Why are these odds ratios across these diverse populations so weak? So there are several answers to this question. I'm going to focus on two in this talk. But just to mention the answers, they include, which I've already said, psychiatric illnesses are not disease entities. They are syndromes. As much as we like our diagnoses, they are not the definition of diseases. And we expect these to be very heterogeneous. And all the GWAS data, where we have loci across the whole genome, the CNV data, where there are CNVs across the genome, the rare variants across the genome make it very clear that there's no one pathway to these conditions. I'm not going to talk about, I've mentioned rare variants. I'm only going to mention epigenetics very briefly, but I want to talk about epistasis, which is the interaction of genes, and I'm going to talk about the main issue, which is when we ask the question, why are psychiatric genes so weak in their prediction? The answer has to be because there are no psychiatric genes. There are no genes for mental illness. So what are genes? Genes are about the biology of cells. And if you're asking the question is, how does a gene relate to a behavior? It can only relate to a behavior by going through an increasingly complicated series of intermediate biological steps, which ultimately translate into behavioral or psychopathological variation. Genes are only about cells. Genes do not know anything about hallucinations and delusions or panic attacks or depression. Genes know about simple molecules in cells. If you inherit a variation of a gene, it affects the biology of a cell. That cell ultimately is part of, of the formation and function of a brain. Cells process molecular information. Brains process environmental information. And ultimately, our behavioral syndromes are the emergent phenomenology of these problems in brain information processing. This would suggest that if we study individuals who have inherent risk-associated genes but don't manifest illness because they don't make it all the way from here to there, meaning the effects of the genes do not penetrate to the level of behavior, we should be able to see evidence of genetic variation at these levels of analysis with greater effect or greater penetrance. So this has now been studied by a number of different groups. This is a large study from the Institute of Psychiatry in London. We were part of this study. A family twin study over 2,000 subjects looking in families at cognition. We've known that cognition is a, a abnormal cognition is a characteristic of being ill with schizophrenia, but it's also something that's related to genetic risk for schizophrenia. And what they showed in this study was the majority of the variance in cognition within families was shared with the variance in risk for schizophrenia within these families, even if the other people did not have schizophrenia, suggesting that the genetics of schizophrenia in some way related within these families to the genetics of cognitive function whatever the biology of that is. So these are the three points I'm going to make in the rest of this talk, now that I've introduced these principles. I'm going to make three points. The first is that genes for psychiatric disorders are not for psychiatric disorders. That's the critical point. They're about brain development and function. Genetic risk is critically dependent on context. And context means the genetic context, someone's genetic background, and the environment that they experience. And then lastly, I will mention briefly that genes will impact on the prediction of outcome and treatment response and lead to new therapies. So let me just start also the idea with the genes are not for psychiatric illness. The principle here is that if we look at genes that are weakly and inconsistently associated with psychiatric illness, they should show much more robust effects on what we call the intermediate biological phenotypes that allow a gene to go from a sequence to a behavior. So one of the ways one can study this is to look at the brain function of people at genetic risk who don't have illness. So who would that be? How do you study people who are at genetic risk for illness but don't have the illness? Well, the ideal population would be identical twins of people with bipolar disorder or depression or schizophrenia who were not sick. 
It's hard to study identical twins, but there's a, a population you can study almost as good, which is the healthy siblings of patients with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression. Healthy siblings share, on average, 50% of their genome. They will share 50% of the risk genes, but they don't share illness. So if the risk genes have anything to do with how the brain works, the healthy siblings should show evidence that they have similar dysfunctions at this level of analysis that does not translate in, at the behavioral level. And this has been studied now by many groups. These were the early work from our group show, using a simple end back working memory task and functional magnetic resonance imaging that if you looked at patients and controls who were matched for performance, and this is critical, these are people who are all doing as well on the task. Their accuracy was the same, their reaction time was the same, but how their brain did the procedure was not the same. Patients with schizophrenia were what we refer to as less efficient. They were less tuned. They have to engage more brain to get the same level of function. The healthy siblings of patients show the same pattern of exaggerated or inefficient engagement during these tests. This should suggest that genes associated with psychiatric illness should show greater effect on this biological phenotype associated with risk than they should show on illness. And we've shown this now with many, many genes. This is the gene, this calcium channel gene, which was the first GWAS positive, genome-wide association study, positive risk gene for bipolar disorder. This is an L-type calcium channel. This calcium channel gene, which is also now the number one most significant gene associated with schizophrenia, when this was originally found in the bipolar disorder study, it was an N of 10,000, and the p-value was 10 to the minus 8. We showed that this gene also mapped, even in normal people who have no bipolar disorder, no schizophrenia, but they have the risk genotypes. Normal people show this pattern of inefficient engagement of the prefrontal cortex relative to normal people with the non-risk associated genotypes. Is this a more penetrant effect than the clinical association? If you extrapolate this effect size to the same sample size that was positive in the bipolar disorder association, the p-value here is 10 to the minus 109. This is a much more powerful uh, uh, effect of this bipolar disorder schizophrenia gene than is clinical diagnosis. This gene is about how your brain works. It's not about whether you manage to achieve a psychiatric diagnosis or not. Now, this is an interesting example of one gene, one locus affecting your brain and having a risk uh, effect on psychiatric illness. But if you remember, the risk effect at the individual subject level was very small. This is because we're looking at people across the world who have very different genetic backgrounds. And it may be that if we could find people from one specific background, some of these loci, which across these diverse backgrounds show weak effects, in a very specific background, may show very strong effects. And this is the idea that thinking about one gene, one at a time, is a very weak way of understanding human genetics. You have to think about genomes and how individual genomes vary. And this is the concept of epistasis. The effect of genetic variation depends on genetic context within an individual. This was first uh, characterized by Bateson, who defined epistasis as the effect of one genetic locus being blocked by the effect of a specific allele at a different locus. Fisher defined epistasy as the modification of a phenotype related to one locus by another locus. There's a lot of confusion in the literature about what epistasis is. Statisticians talk about epistasis as a nonlinear interaction between loci in the genome. Biologic biologists talk about epistasis as protein interactions within biological networks or pathways. The bottom line being the effect of one gene is critically dependent on other genes. 
I want to give you a story to illustrate this example. Because this paper, which came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States last year, in the fall, in the autumn, is an amazing paper, which I recommend everybody read to understand human evolution and to understand what heterogeneity means. So let me just tell you briefly about this study. This was a study in fruit flies, Drosophila. They took 230 very well characterized inbred fly strains. These are strains of flies that are homozygote at every locus in the genome. They're like an inbred dog. They're like a complete true breed. They took these 230 flies and they did a genome-wide association study looking for what loci in these flies explained three traits, complex traits in the flies. Now, there aren't many complex traits in fruit flies, but two of the complex traits had to do, were as follows. They starve the flies and they see how long it takes the fly to die. That's a complex trait, because flies vary in how long they live when you take away their food. That's one trait. And they found all the genes that contributed to variance in survival time after the flies were starved. And they found about 150 genes. Another complex trait was they froze the flies. They freeze them. And then they see how long it takes them to wake up after they've been frozen. So these, you, know, they're, you have to get very concrete with these flies to get good behavior out of them. And they mapped all the genes that accounted for the, uh, for the variation how long the flies took to wake up. And that was about 150 genes. Then they took these 230 fly strains and they had them breed randomly for 120 generations. They created an outbred fly strain. And so now they have genetic, they take all these unique human beings that all come from very different ancestries and they make them breed together. And they produce an outbred strain of flies, which they called the fly land strain. And now they looked within the fly land strain at what were the genes that accounted for variation, starvation, and coma in a new species of flies that all had the exact same ancestors but in different combinations in every individual fly because the matings were all random across 120 generations. And they found, again, for every one of these behaviors, about 150 genes explained all the variants. How many of those 150 genes in the outbred fly strain were the same as in the inbred fly strains? The answer was zero. Not one gene in this new strain that was made by mixing all these ancestors was the same gene accounting for variants that was in the ancestors. This is a profound lesson in evolution and a profound lesson in how what matters about individual genes and what are the other genes. Let me give you two examples of this. I'm going to move through this very quickly. Th disc one is one of the most popular genes in psychiatry because it was found in a Scottish pedigree um, that uh, where there was, a there was a break in this gene, and this break was found in uh, two-thirds of the people that had this break in the disc one gene had a psychiatric illness. But typical of heterogeneity, some of them had schizophrenia, some of them had bipolar disorder, some of them had depression. There was no one phenotype that the break in this gene had. This gene has been shown in, t in a variety of model systems to be critical in the early elaboration of dendrites in cells. And this was a study we reported about a year ago where we studied what was the mechanism by which disc one caused the elaboration of dendrites in these cells. And what was clear was it was critically dependent on the excitability of these cells. The more excited the cells were, the more they fired action potentials, the more they elaborated dendrites. And this was critically dependent on another gene called NKCC1. And we asked the question that if the effect of DISC1 on brain development was critically dependent on NKCC1, maybe its effect on risk for psychiatric illness was critically dependent on NKCC1. 
And here's the data for this. These are three different populations looking at, the, at, at, at a variation in NKCC1, a variation in DISC1, both of which ex affect the expression of this gene and the combined effects of both. And what you can see is in none of these populations does either of these individual genes make any difference whatsoever. It's only when you put them together that it becomes a factor in risk. So again, you look at one of these by itself, you might be convinced that there's no effect. I'm not going to skip on that. I'm going to go skip. Genes also interact with the environment to modify the expression of their individual effects. Genes interact with each other. They interact with the environment. These interactions also can lead to exaggerated, compensated, or novel effects. So what is an environmental factor that we know contributes to risk for psychiatric illness? Well, we know for schizophrenia, and I should point out this is also true for bipolar disorder. Several large epidemiological studies have now shown that obstetric disorder complications are not unique to schizophrenia, but they clearly increase risk for psychiatric illness. We showed that the, that the effect of obstetric complications, and genes that have been interesting in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, genes like BDNF, GRM3, AKT1, these interact with a history of obstetric complications, and they interact rather amazingly. So this BDNF gene, if you inherit this version of the BDNF gene, and you've had a history of obstetric complications, a serious obstetric complications, the likelihood that you'll be a schizophrenic offspring are 12 times greater than if you didn't have an obstetric complication. How does obstetric complications do this? Well, this is the epigenetic story. Obstetric complications do not change your genome. They change the regulation of your genome. And this is, the, this is a story I don't have time to get into, but it's very important to remember that the genome is packaged it's packaged in a very complex structure called chromatin, which is dependent on secondary modifications of the DNA sequence, including methylation and the histone uh, packaging of genes and, and the DNA. Methylation of the genome is critically dependent on the genetic sequence. The concept of gene-environment interaction is the interaction of your sequence with, your, with the epigenetics of environmental effects. If you don't have the right sequence and you, you experience something that would ordinarily cause there be the methylation, you don't have the methylation. You're resilient. In contrast, if you have a specific sequence that is changeable by the environment, you're susceptible. There's much more that we'll be learning about this down the road. Okay, the very last point I want to make, which I'll take a few minutes on, is that genes will impact on outcome and treatment response and lead to new therapies. There's been a lot of interest in the idea, if you try to look at where all these genes that are coming up about schizophrenia act, they all act in very early aspects of, of brain wiring. They're really about the very early programs of building circuitries, building connections between cells, elaborating processes that form connections. These are about very basic steps that cells make in their maturation and differentiation. And it's, you know, there are probably many different ways that we pharmacologically could impact on the uh, function of these so-called synaptic signaling machinery. Interestingly enough, one of the genes that has come up in the latest GWAS study is a gene that we've been interested in for a very, very long time. It's the D2 receptor. The D2 receptor was never positive as a genetic association before, but it's now 10 to the minus 9 with 70,000 people. As we increase these sample sizes, more and more of the genes we've been interested in for many years will become uh, validated to some degree by this. The problem, of course, is this is a tiny, tiny effect increases the odds of tiny effect. It may be that in some people, the effect is much more significant, but it depends on the other genes. So what are some of the other genes? Well, one of the surprises that we've learned about the D2 receptor, we've spent 30 years thinking that the signaling of the D2 receptor is through cyclic AMP. And this has been the way all the models of understanding neuroleptic, neuroleptic drug action have been built. But it's very clear now that there's another signaling pathway that's completely independent of, of um, cyclic AMP, and it's the so-called AKT pathway. 
And AKT has been interested in schizophrenia because BDNF signals through AKT. Many genes of interest signal through AKT. And it turns out now that so does the D2 receptor signal through AKT. This suggests that we might be able to look at D2 signaling in the context of, that, of its signaling pathway and have much greater resolution of how the D2 receptor matters in terms of risk or in terms of outcome. So this is an example of exactly why this matters. This is the work of Giuseppe Blasi and Professor Bertolino's group. This is a very important paper published last year in, P in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences looking at response to antipsychotic drug treatment where we've known that the effect of the D2 receptor gene itself is a very minimal factor. But if you now control for genetic background in AKT1, it's a much bigger factor. So if now if you look at people with a variant in the D2 receptor and a variant in the AKT, all of which, by the way, is linked to a decreased AKT function, which is probably the critical signaling system that the D2 receptor cares about, this is the people who, who will respond to drugs best. It's an illustration of how we will increasingly be able to personalize medicine by taking these more higher order uh, interaction analyses. I want to mention one new target. I will talk about this more this afternoon. But one of the drugs we've been very, one of the genes we've been very interested in is a potassium channel gene called KCNH2, which is critical for the repolarization of neurons. And we've studied this gene very extensively uh, in a variety of different systems. But what makes this gene particularly interesting is that all antipsychotic drugs bind to this gene. This is the gene responsible for the long QT interval syndrome. It's also the reason that clozapine is associated with the most cases of sudden death, probably because of the, F of the effect of clozapine on this potassium channel. And in fact, this clozapine is the most potent drug for this potassium channel. We've raised the possibility that while D2 receptor antagonism is a very important component of the action of antipsychotic drugs. Their therapeutic effects may have a lot to do with their activity as potassium channel. And we showed this in a recent paper uh, by Jose Apud, who's also a graduate of the University of Milano, uh, looking at the effect of the of variation in this gene on response to antipsychotic drugs. And suffice it to say that the more you express this channel, the better you respond to antipsychotic drugs. This was data from a placebo-controlled study. This is the data from the US multicenter Katie trial. And the bottom line from this study was, which is shown here, the bottom line from this study, looking at the hazard ratio, was that if you had the form of this gene that expressed this specific potassium channel, you were five times more likely to have finished the Katie trial successfully than if you didn't have this form of the gene. And we've just recently shown that with risperidone, you only respond to risperidone if you have this form of the gene. You don't, in fact, risperidone makes you worse if you don't have the form of the gene that's associated with these characteristics. So this may actually be a new target for development of drugs. I will talk about this later this afternoon. I just want to mention the people whose work I've shown you, which includes our neuroimaging group. I didn't really have a chance to show you that work, but the clinical genetics group and the molecular genetics group. And the take home messages are as follows. Most complex behaviors are the result of mul multiple factors that interact biologically. There are many developmental pathways to what we call psychopathology. Most neuropsychiatric disorders are likely the result of epistatic genetic interactions and environmental modification. Genetic risk for schizophrenia and cognitive deficits and affected families share most of the genetic components. Rare cases with the diagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder have a genetic diagnosis. Rare cases, probably less than 3%. Uh, genetic variants impact on treatment response and outcome through many different mechanisms. And genetic information has transformed our understanding of psychiatric disorders, and it is just getting started. And I would like to invite all of you, if you want a deeper discussion of some of these issues, to visit our website. And thank you very much again for inviting me to speak to you. It's been a real joy.